Welcome, I'm your host, John Humanic. Today, I'm going to teach you how to disarm the sin that so easily ensnares you. Take some notes because this video may be the final step in your journey to set you totally free from all the remaining sins and bondages you have in your life. Not only will it fully guide you into a place of restoration and peace, you'll be well positioned to know how the enemy works against you and will continue to keep you safe from his traps. Please make sure you subscribe to this channel. If you're not a member of this channel, please sign up for our membership. We provide exclusive benefits for members not found anywhere else on our channel. To get started, break out your notebooks and let's go. We're going to start with Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 through 2 because this sets a firm foundation for what we're trying to accomplish in this teaching. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles or ensnares, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow, what a powerful set of verses. So we have to start to unpack what this means and how it will apply to you. Because what God is saying in this set of verses through the author, who many believe is Paul, and what you start to see is, is that there is a sin. There's something in your life that easily ensnares you. That's the case for every single person on this planet. There is a sin that will entice you and say, hey, come here, let's go ahead and have some fun. So what you must understand is if you do not recognize that sin yet, that's the first step in your walk is you have to figure out what is the one sin that you just go to and enjoy and just love doing. That's the first sin we have to recognize. We have to identify it. If you've already been in that position where you recognize it, maybe it's some form of addiction, which is a very common thing for people to be caught up in. Maybe it's lying. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's something where you like to steal things and enjoy the thrill of the process. You have to first understand how it is actually coming about in your life, because what we're going to do is set up an understanding of how how Satan creates traps for you because that's the essence of what it means about ensnaring. So what I want you to take a moment is visualize you're walking down uh, through the forest. Okay, so you're walking through the forest and there's a clear path in front of you. And then all of a sudden you notice that the path opens up and then you start to see on this path, maybe this circle that's kind of buried right under the dirt. You're wondering why? Why does that look like that? What that means is, is it's a representative of a snare, a trap that once you walk into it, will pull you up into the trees and entrap you. It could also be one that basically opens up. It's like a false floor where you fall into it. Now you're in a pit. That's the essence of what it means to so easily ensnare you. I really want you to capture this vision today because this is how you're going to be able to completely conquer the sin from this point on. So what you have to understand is, is that the snare will sit there. Think about it from the perspective of a trapper. If you're trying to trap something, you set a snare. Well, if nothing crosses the snare's path, nothing triggers it. Guess what happens? The snare will just sit there. In fact, not only will it sit there, it will remain motionless until something comes across its way and triggers it. So if you're on a path that has a, a trap in it, and you walk around it, guess what happens? It doesn't get set off. If an animal doesn't walk across it, it doesn't get set off. It will sit there dormant. This is really important. It will sit there dormant until something sets it off. And that's how this works. Satan sets traps for you in your life that will remain dormant throughout all of your life unless two things happen. One, you set it off 
or two, you disarm it. That's really the ultimately, ultimately how you manage it. Because ultimately, when you think about it, if you need the snare to move, you've got to disarm it or you've got to throw something in to set it off and then you can disarm it. Either way, you have to get rid of it. Walking around the problem over and over again is not going to fix it because the trap is still there. No different than if it was a pit. Imagine if it was a pit and it was a false floor. So think about it. If you decide to walk around it and not remove the false floor and fill the pit, anyone could follow your footsteps and fall into the pit later. Anyone that could be your children, that could be friends and family, it could be animals, it could be anything. So think about it, like you're out in the forest and you're trying to navigate this situation where you're trying to engage this trap that Satan put in front of you. This is what Hebrews is talking about because Satan puts a trap in front of you that may entice you. He may put bait in the trap. He may do something that says, hey, what's this? And maybe you want to go into it. But that's how we're going to start this teaching off and understand that Satan creates traps for you that remain dormant in your life and will be triggered whenever you set it off and therefore sin or you choose to say, no more, I'm going to disarm that trap, and it's done with. And that every time you see that trap again, whether it's really easy to obvious, really easy to see or not so obvious, and you just go ahead and just address it at that point in time. This is really important when you want to understand how things operate in this kingdom of darkness and how it works so relentlessly against you because these traps are designed to destroy. That's the key thing is people think sin is fun and enjoyable because we know that the flesh the flesh is heaven is on earth. There is no place it's going. It's not going to heaven with us. Even during the rapture, the flesh gets shed and a new body is formed. So the only time it's going to enjoy itself is going to be here on earth. So it's going to take advantage of every opportunity it can because it's important for it to be able to enjoy itself. But for you, you don't want it to do any of that. So it's really important to understand that the Satan and his armies will continue to lay traps for you over and over again in your life. And the, the most effective way to address the traps are to disarm them, to recognize them, to understand your trigger points, and to address them uh, completely. And we're going to cover all of those things uh, as a part of this teaching. Now, the one thing that I really want to make sure I explain, and this is going to be hard, especially for the men who watch this live stream and in and, and the teachings afterwards, is, is you cannot keep your sin a secret. Obviously, you're going to be confessing your sin to your Heavenly Father and getting that reconciled as it happens. That's key because you don't want to be carrying that weight around with you. But you must understand that you do need, if especially with the secret sin, you don't have to do this with every single sin because the Bible talks about that it's not about uh, basically laying your life bare before a person, but if you're caught up in a secret sin where you can't get out of it, and this is the purpose of this teaching is to completely smash that sin so that you can live completely free you ultimately have to tell someone about it. And you have to understand that, remember, Jesus talks about that you must talk to trusted people. That's what he talks about. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. That, that is a huge context for a lot of different things. And this is one of them. You, When you are stuck in a sin that you can't get out of, that the trap keeps pulling you in, the bait keeps you know enticing you, whatever that may be, and you get sucked into the trap and then you sin, the one of the ways to start this healing process, which is part of the journey to actually eliminate the secret sin in your life, is that you must actually confess it to others. And so we see this from James chapter 5, verse 16. And he writes, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now let's unpack this verse a little bit, because what we see here is that he talks about prayer as a part of your intercession for one another. So whenever you have someone coming up to you confessing a secret sin, the key aspect to understand is, is that they want this part of their life done with. And so you're going to be entrusted with information that ultimately, I'm just going to be clear with you, may ultimately be uh, very, very dangerous for that person to be spoken out loud. And you can understand there's a lot of different contexts that could be legally, marriage-wise, uh, family, work. Sins are designed to destroy. They're designed to steal 
first, then kill, then destroy. So when someone is coming up to you and, and, and basically bearing their life before you, you might be in a position where you're going to hear junk that you don't want to hear, but God's going to put you in a position to stand in a, as an intercessor and pray that that person becomes healed because they need their heart and their mind to orient themselves with on the will of God on their life in order to be able to experience all that God has for them. And so you're entrusted with this. And so therefore you cannot gossip. You cannot share this. This is not something that you're going to be sharing with others. If you have a, a sin that you want to share with someone, you do have to take the inverse of that and know that the person you're going to speak to is very trusted. That person may be your spouse, may not be your spouse. It may be your brother or sister. It may be a mentor. It may be a pastor. You know, there's actually an opportunity to confess your sin. The 700 Club has a, a 1-800 number. If I remember correctly, it's like one 800 700 7000 where you can publicly announce your sin to a person who doesn't know you, and therefore you are allowed to basically make known what was unknown. This is so important. If you don't have someone in your life, there's a lot of different communities, the 700 Club being one of them, where you can call and talk to someone and confess your sins and they can pray with you. The key part about all of this is, is that the devil will basically beat you up with things that are in secret. But once they come out to the light, guess what happens? It's impossible for it to, to be able to be used against you because it's that's how he works. He only works whenever to, he works in the context of being able to work in the darkness. And then when the light is shining on this, it allows you to completely disarm and destroy the works of the devil. Now, again, this is a hard thing for a lot of people to do. That's why a phone call is a really cool option for you. It's something that allows you to kind of, you know, basically take the personal aspect out of it. It takes the judgmental aspect out of it, but you also want to foster within you yourself opportunity for people to confess sins to you because you want to be a trusted advisor. This is how you start the process. You, you understand that there's a snare out there that can be used against you. And then when you do fall into it by grace, you're going to ask for forgiveness and you can restart the process. And so it's really important to understand that there's, there's this next step here. And God took me to this verse the other day to create a foundation on how to completely disarm the snares that Satan has for you. And in fact, when he showed it to me, I was like, what on earth are you showing me within the context of this verse? Not normally is something I come across a verse like this, but it was really powerful once I started to unpack its meaning. Psalm 64, verse five, literally in the middle of the Bible, it's like just this really cool verse. It says, they encourage each other in evil plans. They talk about hiding their snares and they say, who will see it? So when you are when you start to understand a couple of things is that there is an actual army working against you. That's reality. When you're saved, you've moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Whether you like it or not, if you're not saved, you're in the kingdom of darkness. If you believe a God that's other than Jesus Christ, you're operating under the evil one's plans, whether you like it or not. Even if you're doing good, even if you're a pastor serving in a church, if you're not saved, you're operating in the kingdom of darkness. But once you moved over to the kingdom of light, there you're completely now the enemy of the enemy. And the enemy wants to destroy you every chance he has. And so he's going to create plans. You have to recognize this. In your life, he is going to trip you up and try to hurt you every way he can. That doesn't mean that you actually have to be tripped up, but you have to recognize that there is an actual force that's coming against you. And if you don't recognize that, guess what happens? You become you become completely cannon fodder. And if you're not familiar with cannon fodder, it basically means it's basically the target that they put in front of the cannon to test it out. And you're literally just gonna get blitzed and blitzed and blitzed until you recognize that there's an active plan against you and your life. And when you start to understand that you can start to plan and think, okay, how can I operate and understand and recognize the hidden snares? Because that's the key is their snares are designed not to be seen. Think about it from the perspective. Let's say you're caught in alcohol addiction or a pornography addiction. It's two of the really most difficult ones, or even a drug addiction. So, because addictions are very difficult, whether it's alcohol, drugs, or pornography, or some form of that, it could be gambling. Whenever you're caught in those situations, there are all forms of triggers. 
there's things like, oh, you're going to go out with a social friend and, hey, hang out at a, a, at a pub or at a bar or at a restaurant. And there's all these triggers where they're pushing alcohol on you. Or if you're, if you're uh, caught in some form of drug addiction, you know you're going to get caught with the clubs or in the side corners or in the alleyways. Or if a dealer comes by and says, hey, do you need anything? Do you need your, your daily fix? Or if you're caught in pornography, it's your cell phone and your phone. And that one's one of the more challenging ones because it's very difficult to get away with because it's on your electronics all the time, even if you put on all forms of uh, filters and stuff. And then you have the gambling one, which you could be driving by and you see a billboard with gambling or you see an advertisement on a football game. It's all over ESPN now. That's something where they even promote it. So these things are specifically designed to be hidden in plain sight to trigger you. That's the essence of how the secret sin works. Is it maybe a trigger and then boom, a reaction, or it may be this slow building up process. Remember, if you don't uh, basically trigger the snare, it's gonna remain dormant until you do. So you can continue to walk around it, but eventually if you're not gonna pay attention, you're gonna step into it and get caught. That's the essence of how these things work. You have to address the problem in order to address the sin. And the sin gets addressed by the problem. And the problem is the snare. That's the key part. When you start to recognize that the snare is specifically designed to be hidden, it's planned, it's operating against you, now you have the capability to disarm it because you now you have revelation knowledge of something you didn't know otherwise. So you're going to say, well, how do I then combat it? So let's say, for example, you're dealing with a pornography issue where your phone or your computer constantly becomes this snare that you can't get away from. Well, ultimately, you have to start to understand how the snare works, because at the end of the day, this is so key. You were specifically designed to rule over sin not the other way around. And you're going to say, well, where does that in the Bible? Well, let me go ahead and show you. Genesis, Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. It says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Wow. This is really powerful because let me unpack this. So what we have here is when we're looking at the context of the Bible, we're at the beginning of the story. Adam and Eve has sinned. They've got their two sons, and now they both have sacrifice to God. So this is the beautiful part. If people believe sacrifice was a part of the Mosaic Law, this is the chapter that shows that sacrifice predates the Mosaic Law. And that's why when you see the ter third temple later in, in all the prophecies, that the sacrificial parts come back into place because they were not attached to the Mosaic Law. And so the Abrahamic covenant and all these things, they all came later. So what you have is this beautiful situation where Cain and Abel go to sacrifice to God, and Abel brings uh, the, basically the best of his flock, and Cain brings uh, what, would, what appears to be a subpar grain offering. And so he kept the good grain for himself and sacrificed the subpar to God, where Abel said, no, I'm giving God my best. And so guess what happens? God recognizes that this becomes a sin for Cain, and he tells Cain, Look, if you do what's right, won't you be accepted? You don't have to worry about a grain offering because I'm going to give you more grain and better grain. But what happens is the sin is starting to crowd at your door and it wants you and it wants to rule over you, but you must rule over it. So what you start to understand is an, an eschatology, which is like a study of all kinds of um, different kinds of what I call symbolic things that represent uh, aspects of life. What you start to see here is in this moment is Moses, because he's the author of Genesis, is saying, look, sin is an actual entity. And this entity has a will to completely overwhelm you. And so that's what he's trying to, she's trying to picture it. So if you're trying to visualize, get a lot of this is symbolic, but what we're trying to understand is, is this is truly where you start to unlock and disarm the secret sin, is there's actually two levels. There's the sin that's the noun, and then there's the sin that's the verb or the adjective. So what you start to understand is, is that what Moses is trying to depict in this 
set of verses is that there's actually a doorway. And in the doorway behind, hidden in the corner, in the darkness, there is this chaos monster known as sin. It's a basically, it's going to be like a vampire, something that wants to, as you walk through the door of sin, it wants to sink its teeth into you and inject venom. So that's basically the context. It's like the old chaos monsters like Leviathan and others that are mentioned like from Job and things. So what you're starting to understand is, is that there's actually two components of sin. There's this actual entity that's moving out there that's trying to destroy you, which is what we talked about earlier which is that there's multiple aspects of sin. There is the evil forces working against you, and potentially in some cases people, but otherwise it's really this force that's specifically designed to try to destroy your life. And then there's the action of sin, which then becomes representative of the snare. So there's two aspects that you must represent and understand, because when you start to unpack these pieces, you start to realize, wow, this is actually multi-layered. And when you recognize the fact that this is multi-layered, the sin that so easily ensnares you, guess what? its days are completely numbered. That's the reality, because now you start to recognize the actions of others, the actions of the enemy. You start to recognize your own actions, the things that have been underneath the surface, these latent things that have been hidden, like they're down here, but they're now here, and you can see it. Guess what happens is now you can start to operate in clarity so that when the sin is in front of you, guess what happens? You can disarm the trap and you can move on. And so the enemy loses every single time. This is a very important understanding because when you start to recognize and unpack these elements, the things that were used against you can no longer be used against you because the enemy is finite. The enemy can only do so much to work against you. And in fact, what happens is, is when you go through this cycle over and over again, what you start to recognize is that they just do the same thing over and over again. You, When you've conquered one aspect of what they're doing and you conquer number two and you conquer number three, guess what happens? They may go back to number one. They may go back to number two. They may go back to number three. But guess what? Generally, you're speaking four and five and six don't exist. So this is so important because when you start to recognize how sin as a chaos monster, the noun, how the people, how the evil forces, how even yourself trip yourself up, you will start to recognize the actions that follow, the adjectives, all the things that decorate the sin that get you so excited. You'll not only smash it before that happens, you'll smash the enemy in the process. And it's so powerful to recognize this. So when you start to recognize that it's venom that it wants to destroy, it's 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 the poison it wants to inject you, that's when you start to realize, wow, okay, now I start to understand that even though I may be enjoying this sin, it literally is like ultimately like a cancer. It's designed to eat you from the inside. It's like hollowing you out. It's like all these things. It's basically burrowing inside of you in order to take what's outside and make it frail and make it weak so that you can fall. But Christ wants to fill you up with the Holy Spirit every single day and baptize you over and over again and basically go into those cracks and restore them and take all these empty spaces and fill it with his living water and empower you in a powerful way. Now you'll start to understand the the context and how to start to win. So now ultimately you have to think about, well, how do I break the bonds of sin? Like, how do I overcome this? Because once you start to recognize the actions of the enemy against you, you still ultimately have to say no to the sin that so easily ensnares you. But here's where it begins, because this is how God, who helped me smash my secret sin, started with. He said in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, it says, you, which he's talking about Jesus, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Wow. So what Jesus recognized and emulated for us is two aspects, that he loved God's righteousness. He loved it with everything that he had, and he hated sin. Now think about that. Think about that from the perspective of your life. Do you hate the sin that so easily ensnares you? 
Do you hate that drink that you love having? Do you hate that drug? Do you hate that website? Do you hate that gambling game? Do you hate to lie? Do you truly hate to steal? Because until you get to that point, what's going to happen is that trap is going to remain there because you're going to be enticed by the bait that's in it. You have to come to the realization that ultimately the sin that so easily ensnared you ultimately will basically turn your nose. Think about it from the perspective of basically anything that's rotten or sour or smells, something that's maybe like garbage or just something that just turns your stomach. That's what has to happen. You have to go from the place of where this sin, just your, your flesh just loves it and just enjoys and relishes in it it moves over to the other side and says it completely turns your stomach. That's where you have to be. That's your starting point because that's how you ultimately recognize the bait in the snare that's in front of you. It's like, okay, that is no longer interesting to me anymore. A picture from a perspective of snares, so we'll go back to the forest example that we talked about earlier. If you're in the middle of the forest and you're, you see in the snare, maybe you see this pile of flowers that you love. Maybe it's your favorite flower. Maybe it, it's, it's, it's got beautiful smells and effervescence. You've got to be able to look at that pile of flowers and say, you know what? That's a pile of garbage. And now you can now move to the snare because here is the key part to recognize. If your focus is on the bait, then your focus is no longer on the sin, the monster that's working against you, and the snare that's right in front of you. Because remember, you can't trigger the snare unless you walk into it. And so therefore, you have, you're have you basically chasing the bait. And if the bait no longer entices you, now you're in, the, you're in the first position to start disarming the snare that's in front of you so that when the trap is laid, you don't have to step into it. It's really important. But how do you start there? How do you get to a point where you're like, wow, I'm in this part where I have this sin that just messes me up every single time. It just sucks me right in and I just can't fight it. Well, guess what? God has a great solution for you. It's the daily renewal of your mind. Romans 12, 2, powerful verse. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay, there's a little bit of a mouthful, but what does that ultimately mean? It means that the world wants you to conform to itself because everything about the world is, has some form of lie. It's always some form of counterfeit. If you understand how the world works, it's counterfeits of counterfeits. This is why people get so confused with religions because they see counterfeits of counterfeits of counterfeits and they're like, well, what's the truth? Like there has to be a truth. And then they, but there's so many out there that it basically prevents them. It clouds their vision from seeing. And so in order to see clearly, you must undo the garbage that's in your head. You have to remove the strongholds. You have to stop believing the lies that have so easily ensnared you. You have to stand on the word of God and say, guess what? I'm not going to concede anything that is against God's word. His will over my life aligns. The promises are there. But how do you do that? Well, this is key because you have to renew your mind. But how do you do that? Okay, it's easy for me to you know speak off a Bible verse and say, well, okay, that's not applicable, but it is. So here's the cool thing. A study in the Cell Journal, okay, this is a basically a, a group of people, scientists, and put out a, a study that said our bodies can create up to 700 new neurons every single day, regardless of how old you are. Which means that when you restart your day, every single morning, these neurons that are in your brain are completely blank. They're unprogrammed and they're ready to receive some word of knowledge. So this is really powerful because now you're going to start to understand how Romans 12, 2 works and how you can put the things in place to start to renew your mind because you have to align yourself with the word of God. And when you understand the word of God, you can then renew your mind and then you're ready to recognize the bait. You're ready to recognize the trap. You're ready to recognize the enemy and you're now one step closer to disarming it. How do you do that? Well, in the morning, what do you do? What are the first set of things that you do in the morning? Do you go out and watch uh, the morning news? Do you go out and watch social media? Are you doing anything that isn't of God? Are you out and about hanging out with your friends, gossiping about people? 
What you're doing in those first hours, and it basically it is over the course of the day, is you are literally programming your mind to believe something that's not of God. If you decide the first thing I'm going to do is go to go to the gym, what your body does is it learns that, hey, the gym is one of the, if one of, if not the most important thing that I have to do. You, what you're doing is, is you're sucking yourself into the world system and it wants you to plant all of these weeds in your mind so that you no longer understand the truth because you're confused. You don't have any form of discernment. You have no form of knowledge. You have no form of revelation. And no way we have any form of wisdom because you got nothing to stand on. But what you do is if you choose to spend time reading the word of God, praying, listening to your father, programming those new brain cells every single day, what will happen is over time, day over day, week over week, quarter over quarter, year over year, guess what's going to happen? Your mind is going to become a steel trap for God and it will recognize every single attempt by the world and you will no longer be shaken by anything it has to throw at you. This is key because as you're stepping into this season where you're trying to smash the sin, you do have to understand that there's multiple aspects to it. But if your mind is clouded by the world's systems, the desires, the worries, the pains, the struggles, all the things it wants to put on you, you can't stand on the word of God because you're so focused on trying to address the problem that's in front of you. You're basically in either some form of torment or you're on the hamster wheel and you're just trying to get by. You're either trying to get to your next paycheck, you're trying to deal with your kids, you're trying to manage your work or school, maybe some homework, whatever it may be, you are caught up in this cycle. But what God says in Matthew 6, 23, says, be about my business, be about my kingdom, be about my righteousness, chase those. I'll take care of the other things. So if you're caught in a poverty mindset where you have to work uh, week to week for your check and you're, you're just struggling to get by, guess what? You've become a slave to money. Whether you've liked it or not, poverty attaches you to money. That's your only choice because now you have to struggle. You have to either be dependent on the government, family members, church, or some other you know structure or apparatus to get you by, to feed you. And now you become a slave to money and whether you like it or not. If you're caught up in the gym or if you're caught up in how you look or how you approach yourself, well, guess what? You're caught up in all the external things of this world. And so now what happens is when Satan lays a trap in front of you, you can't see it because you don't even recognize it because you're so distracted because you're over here focusing on these things and you don't have any clarity. And so it's so important that your habits have to change. Your routine is critical because without a routine, you don't establish the patterns and the habits that you need in order to be able to function and operate in the kingdom mindset. So you have to be able to recognize that you can renew your mind and when you renew your mind, that thing that so easily ensnared you will become more and more disgusting. It doesn't mean that you will not fall into the trap. Like, let's be fair. We're humans. We have flesh. We fall into it. We'll get sucked into it. But at the end of the day, it will get less enticing and less enticing. And eventually, it'll get to the point where it's like no longer. Those flowers that you saw in a trap will actually look like weeds. And in time, you're like, wow, why did I pick up those sticks? They're burnt and disgusting. And they smell like garbage. They were never flowers in the first place. The trap made them look like flowers, but they were just burnt sticks that were designed that had thorns on them. And so the thing that you have to understand is that even in all the instances of sin, you still need Jesus Christ to overcome it. You've got to be able to put your faith in the rock, the cornerstone that cannot be budged. And the scriptures talk about that because this is not a lone person. And by no means am I saying this is something you can do by yourself, because in fact, you can't do any of this by yourself. You need the Holy Spirit the whole way. But this is the scripture that will help you trust that when the sin is addressed, it's addressed because there's so many people that are condemned by sin that they don't even understand that how sin actually works in this world. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, God made him, who's Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in, in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, this is really important because you are the righteousness of God. 
you as a saved Christian, as a person who's operating in a kingdom mindset, whether you are walking in sin or not, you are the righteousness of God. And what that means is, is that Jesus has taken all of the shame, all of the curse, all of the punishment, everything that came with the sin that you don't want, nobody wants, was put on him, nailed to the cross, and then he made a spectacle of it afterwards. And so you have to understand that this is a one and done thing. It says it, it's one and done. And it even talks about this in Hebrews 10, chapter 10, verse 12. And it says, by that, by our will, I'm sorry, and by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Christ once and for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs the religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So what you start to see is, is you can now recognize all of the false doctrines that continue to try to ensnare you. You are the righteousness of Christ. So when you sin, you can go to the Father and ask for forgiveness. But guess what? That sin is not condemning in the context of death because Jesus took that condemnation on the cross. That's what it means. Cursed is be who on a tree. That's condemnation because it's an eternal separation. So we see these doctrines that pop up all the time. You see purgatory in the Catholics and in some of the Orthodox that believe that there's this cleansing process after you die because of the sins. No, that's a total lie. It says, Paul says, when you are absent from the body, you are present with the Lord. There is no in-between. There is no purgatory. There is no cleansing process because you are already, right now, the righteousness of Christ. You have to understand the truth. When you understand the truth, you can look at the biblical doctrines that these religions are trying to push on you and recognize that they're wrong. Not only are they wrong, they're traps because they put you back. So what it does is that God sets you free from one thing and then the devil traps you with another. And so he keeps you trapped like, oh, I'm going to have to go through this cleansing process after I die. No, Jesus already went through that. It's a done deal. It's also get caught up. People will talk about, well, you have to repent all the time. Every single morning, you have to repent. Every single time before you go to bed, you have to repent. Because if you don't repent before you die, you're going to go to hell. Wow, that's a total false doctrine. Because look at the thief on the cross. Go ahead and study it. Study the thief on the cross and see where he asked for forgiveness, where he was baptized, where he went to church. It didn't happen. None of those things happened. All he did was recognize Jesus Christ was Lord, rebuked the other criminal, and said, Will you remember me when you enter your kingdom? And that was it. That was it. And yet Jesus carried him to heaven. So now what you start to understand is all these false doctrines, all these things that move against you are specifically designed to continue to trip you up. These are more snares on your path that, that Satan wants to put in front of you with different bait in order to trap you, to get you back to fall into sin and allow you to go back into that place where you were. That's the whole purpose. He doesn't want you on the mountaintop. Because a dominating free Christian will crush his kingdom over and over again. Whereas if he can continue to trip you up with all these false lies and all these things, well, this, this individual, like the Pope, he's highly esteemed and he's great and you have to believe everything he says. Well, he's a human being like all of us, so therefore he lies no different than anyone else. And the doctrines that these, these religions believe in are false and continue to trap you. In fact, when you start to recognize that the vast majority majority of the religions that are out there, even the Christian ones, the vast majority of the ones, their doctrines aren't biblical. In fact, when you start to recognize all the aspects of them, especially the Presbyterians, which has a ton of false doctrines, when you start to understand those things, you start to recognize, wow, this is just yet another snare that's been on my path that I continue to fall into and continue to get caught up in. And that's what they want. They want to indoctrinate you, they being Satan, wants to indoctrinate you into a path where you no longer recognize the truth. But what we remember, we have the three aspects. We have the sin, the noun, the sin, the verb, and then this action of stepping into it. But when you start to recognize, oh, wait a minute, there's all these different aspects that are part of it. I can recognize the individual that's working behind it, whether it's Satan or a person. Because remember, a religious authority can send you straight to hell as anything, because Jesus talked about that. He even said that to the Pharisees. You go all over the place looking to save someone, and then you make them twice the child of hell that you are. 
So this is a true statement. This is biblical. You can have religious authorities try to convert you over and turn you into twice the, the evil person that they are. And you have to recognize that there is a force that's coming against you that has actions that it wants you to believe are true and are okay in order for you to step into the trap. That's the three-step process. When you start to recognize those things over and over again, you start to see, wow, I can disarm every single trap there is on my life. And now you can make the enemy pay in the process. It's so key. So now you start to recognize all of these things is that there's an actual activity that someone's doing. There's the, the, the basically the bait that they're trying to get you in and then you're receiving it. Now you can start to walk into the truths, but how do you understand? How do you start to overcome these truths? How do you, how do you understand and overcome and become something that God wants you to be? Well, that's really powerful too, because it talks about Revelation 12, 11, he covers it. And he says, they, they triumphed over him. This is the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the words of their testimony. They did not love, love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So this is key because this is a very layered statement. So we're going to go ahead and unpack it because what they're, what he's saying is, is that the Christians triumph over the enemy by the blood of Jesus and the words of their testimony and to the point where they did not care about their life. And so when you start to surrender your life to God, that's what it says. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil and he will flee. It's multiple steps. You have to submit yourself to God first. You can then resist the devil and then he has to go. Now you have the components needed in order to walk out all this revelation knowledge you just got, because it's by the blood of the lamb. You have to recognize that you are the righteousness of Christ, which means I am already a living and breathing testament of Jesus Christ on this earth. I don't need anything else. I already have the Holy Spirit. I already have the blood of the Lamb. That's it. I can move forward. And now you can start to conquer these aspects of your life because now you recognize them as obstacles instead of uh, entrancing uh, things that ultimately become traps. So you can start to walk these things out. Your words mean something. We've talked about this on this channel a ton. Your words, your words, your words. It's so key. You speak what you believe and what you speak comes into being. Look at all of the people in the Bible. Whatever they said came to pass, good and bad. When the, the, the 12 went into the promised land and came back and gave the reports to Joshua and to Moses, guess what happened? The two that gave a good report said we can conquer the land, conquer the land. The 10 that gave a bad report said that we can't, didn't. And so it's so important that your words mean everything because your words of testimony conquers the evil one because now you can start to destroy the traps with your words because you're thinking to myself, well, how do I actually execute and manage the traps? Well, it's easy. You can start to recognize that there's a temptation coming. And you can recognize, oh, wow, I can feel it up. For me, what happens is it basically, it's like this warm and enticing feeling that kind of comes up and hits me. And so at that moment, I'm like, okay, I'm starting to get distracted because I'm taking off my path of where I'm focusing on. And now it's trying to pull me into this other place. And at that moment, what I can do, and this is my recommendation for you, especially if you're taking notes, is now they've crossed the line. The devil has crossed the line and spiritual warfare is very key. There's a way to operate in spiritual warfare is that you have to use the word of God. And if you don't use the word of God, you can't fight because that is literally your only offensive weapon. So you must be able to use the word of God against the enemy at this time. And so what you can do is you can bind the enemy that came against you, the actual spirit or spirits that came against you. And you don't need to know their names. There's a lot of folks in the deliverance ministries that wants to understand their names, the count, you know, what's their background, you know, social security number, you know, date of birth. It doesn't matter. None of those things matter. Okay. And they don't even have the last two. And so Technically, if they were created or, or birth, they probably had one, but if it's a demon, but either way. So the, at the end of the day, what you're trying to accomplish is you're binding the demon. So you bind the demon, you bind the strong man that sent it, which basically is the manager. That's what basically strong men are. And then you can bind the kingdom that's operating with it. So that way there's anything else that's there. And then you can bind whoever spoke it into being and cast them into the abyss and it's done. So you bind the spirit 
the strong man, the kingdom, and the person that's operating against you, and you cast them into the abyss. And you're going to say, well, is that biblical? Of course it is, because it says in the Bible, whatever you bind in heaven is bound on earth. Whatever is loosed in heaven is loosed on earth. So because you're the righteousness of Christ, you can loose blessings on yourself. But you can also bind things in order so they can't operate against you. And what happens is that's how you destroy the traps. Because whenever those beings continue to come against you, whoever they are, they're now going to have to pay a price. Because it's a war. That's the key thing. A lot of people don't like hearing this, but at the end of the day, you're in a war. And a lot of people think the kingdom of God on earth is this cruise ship where you're out there partying and you're having fun. You got your drinks. You're out there on the beach tanning. Maybe you're up on the top, you know, going through some water slides. That's not how it works. When you cross into the kingdom of God, you go from land onto a battleship. You go and land into an army. That's what you are. You're in an army. You're in a fight. And so God explains how to fight because he says, even as Jesus uh, showed it to us as he went up into the wilderness, he used the word of God to disarm the traps that Satan used against him. That's how you do it. You have to use scripture. You have to pray the scriptures. You have to speak the scriptures. What happens now is every time the devil comes at you, you can recognize it because there's usually some form of emotion that comes with it, whether it's a form of temptation, unease, lack of peace, something with it. And when the subtle ones come, especially ones that are like heaviness, where you start to feel yourself like sinking, the heaviness spirits, you'll be able to recognize them and say, wow, I can bind the spirit of heaviness. I can bind that strong man that came with that. And I can bind anyone else that operated with them, whether it was scout spirits, monitoring spirits, there's all kinds of different name spirits, but they're not actually, that. that's just what they do. They're not actually in the sense of like, when you think about them, it's just what people call them because that they're called by their actions. But the reality is, is they all operate. That would be no different than saying, Hey, you know, there's a tank commander. So I'm going to call him tank commander. That's his name. Well, that name, that guy's name could be Bob. We don't know that. But at the end of the day, that's how they work is they all have their assignments and we recognize them by their actions. And so you can bind all those spirits, cast them into the abyss, because guess what? Jesus had the opportunity to cast legion into the abyss, and they knew he could because they pleaded with him over and over again not to send them into the abyss. And so clearly he had the authority to do it. Paul talks about we have the ability to judge angels. That's in scripture. And so when you attach all those components together, what you get is the final package. You get the three pieces that you need in order to work out and walk out this life of victory because you have to destroy the snares in your life. Because remember the picture we talked about. If you don't disarm the trap, the trap stays there. And until you destroy it, with your words, it will eventually trip you or someone else up. That's the power of how Christian walks are meant to be walked out. This is why when you see people operating not in the Christian manner, what they want to do is disarm the Christian of their words. That's what they do. They always want to steal the words because that's what God talked about. Satan is like the bird that comes in and steals the seed once it lays on the ground. He's a thief. He doesn't want you speaking life. He doesn't want you binding his demons because guess what? He only has so many. He isn't making new ones. Their angels aren't falling out of the sky, joining his legion. Those things are done and passed. So if you're binding and casting his army into the abyss, guess what happens? He has less troops to send against you. And eventually what happens over time would between the renewing of your mind, the recognizing of the sin, understanding what's God and what's not God, and then binding and casting those beings into the abyss and constantly disarming and recognizing the pattern that he uses against you, you can completely disarm and destroy the sin that so easily ensnares you. And so now when you look at the scriptures and you understand what they were talking about and you recognize the key aspects and what God was trying to do, you can really start to understand what they talk about. You can go back to Hebrews and look at that. Hebrews 12 verses one through two, the one we started with, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Guess what? And now let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Think about it from that perspective. What you're doing is, is what you're doing is, is you're basically making things public. 
by speaking things. You are surrounded by the witnesses. You're throwing everything off. You're saying, I'm not going to be bothered by these things anymore. I'm going to see the snares that are being laid out by the enemy and I'm going to verbally destroy them. And so now I can start to run. And when I run, I can focus on the path that Jesus has for me because I'm fixated on Jesus. I'm renewing my mind on a daily basis. I'm not believing what the world has. I'm not believing even what my eyes see. That's Don't trick yourself into thinking that you know better. Don't trick yourself into thinking that what you see in front of you is real. Because remember, these baits, these things that Satan puts in front of you, they're designed to look like flowers, but they're thorns. They're designed to injure, maim, and destroy. And now you can pursue the process, walk this life out in joy and peace and love. You have a hope for tomorrow and a hope for today. And the strength of God will empower you through this process day in and day out. And you will never, never, ever fail because what will happen is, is as long as you fix your eyes on Jesus, renew your mind, fill your mind with the word of God, you will now be able to operate in a kingdom mindset because you're seated in Christ. And now at the end of the day, every time the devil comes to you, you can bind the demons that come against you. And even if you sin and you fall into the trap, still bind them. Don't even hesitate to do it after the fact. Make them pay after the fact because God's got you. You're the righteousness of Christ. The sin is not going to condemn you. Okay. Your actions you can speak these things and smash the trap, smash the, the aspects of the demons, and you will set yourself free day in and day out. And what will happen is throughout this entire process, they will get tired, they will get weary, and you will get strengthened over and over again. As they get weaker, you will get stronger. And guess what happens? Victory is in your hands. So I hope you really enjoyed this teaching and I pray that you watch it. If this is one of those teachings, if I recommend watching it over again because it will give you and unlock the aspects and be able to basically throw off this secret sin because the secret sin is not a part of any Christian walk. You don't want to walk a compromised life in any way, shape, or form. Don't give an inch to the devil. Don't give him legal right to attack you and your family and your finances. Smash them, smash every single door and every single sin in your life, and you'll be able to walk free. And I pray that if you are love this content, I want to invite you now to become a monthly partner. We have a sensational mission here at John Humanic Ministries. We continue to search out a thousand salvations per month. We've had a great month so far, and we're going to continue to be excited for the things that are ahead of us. And we're really, really looking forward to continuing to spread the gospel throughout the world. And we're partnering with churches and ministries through social media and through other aspects to make it happen so that they can help others live a dominating and conquering life for Jesus Christ in the most exciting way possible. And you can do this by going to our website. That is humanic.com slash partner. It's H-U-M-E-N-I-K.com slash partner. There you can make a one-time donation if you so choose to, or you can partner with us and be able to be a part of this ministry and everything that we receive goes back into the ministry to go out there, spread the gospel, bring